one of, if not the largest tech companies in the world, is going to be looking at utilizing 3D printing in end use production. Apple. That Apple, iPhones and Apple Watches, is looking at using 3D printing in end-use production. Let's talk about it. Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. And hey, if you're new here and you like hearing about awesome news in the 3D printing industry, make sure to leave a like and get subscribed. We want to cover more of these news subjects, but maybe in a shorter format. Let me know if you guys would like to see that kind of thing, maybe in like a YouTube short, Instagram reel kind of thing. Would love to know your thoughts down in those comments. But we saw some really interesting news come out of Form Next in Shenzhen. Chinese 3D printer manufacturer Farsoon and Bright Laser Technologies are looking at, reportedly, making end use parts for Apple. Now, it is no secret at all that the Apple Watch packs a lot of juice into a small package. It's like taking a whole bag of oranges and fitting them into a watch. And the milling that is required to do the exterior casing of a watch is non-trivial and 3D printing kind of pretty much solves every one of those problems. Because the thing with 3D printing is that you don't have to get an end mill into little areas. And there are actually really awesome ways to 3D print in metal. Specifically in this case, it is reported that 316L stainless is going to be the material of choice in a binder jetting solution. And we can see that 3D printer manufacturer Easy MFG showed off some of these pieces. Now, do they make them themselves or is that something that Apple sent over? We're not 100% sure at this time, but they're using binder jetting technology. So let's talk a little bit about binder jetting. In fact, I have a binder jetting machine. I would show it to you, but it is very expensive to turn on. Maybe we'll do a stream on it one day where we show you what full color sandstone 3D printing looks like. That is binder jetting, but it's way, way more trivial than what this stuff is. The process of binder jetting is using some sort of glue or binding solution to stick together particles of metal powder. At that point, the material is then put into a sintering oven where it is either infiltrated or fully sintered with raw metal. This process will produce a product with very, very, very low porosity. Binder jetting is an interesting technology where you're literally, think of your inkjet printer. It's pretty much the same. You have a layer of powder and you're putting ink, it's a glue binding agent of some sort, across some powder that sticks it to the powder below it. There you go, binder jetting. And I know that that's very, very, very rudimentary, but work with me. If you guys want to see a deep dive into binder jetting technology, let me know and we can do a really deep episode. Maybe we'll bring on Dan Brunimer, who's a former podcast guest, who has an entire company called B Jetting, where they make uh, somewhat smaller binder jetting machines for prototyping and education. Uh, we'll link to his episode so you guys can take a look. It is very, very technical. So just, you know, slight warning there. But binder jetting is an interesting technology because it is cold and does not require a massive piece of machinery to do it. We look at far soon. Farsoon is best known in the additive manufacturing world for basically saying, oh, you want a couple of lasers on your LPBF, that's layer powder bed fusion machine. How about 20? Farsoon makes a layer powder bed fusion metal 3D printer with 20 freaking lasers in it. Now, interestingly, they chose binder jetting here. Now, again, we've got a few different sources and they're all, you know, not exactly saying it's confirmed, but you'd have to have a lot of information to be able to print something like this. And often it's about as confirmed as you're going to get. Now, binder jetting is an odd tech because different than layer powder bed fusion, which normally uses a laser to center layers of metal powder, binder jetting requires that extra step and in turn produces a relatively high porosity compared to something like DMLS or LPBF, where you're actually melting metal with a freaking laser. Yes, printers with freaking lasers attached to their heads. Uh, but it's more with a Galvo, but not gonna get into that today. The interesting thing with binder jetting is that also when you go to center it, it shrinks. 
a lot. But the thing is, it is considerably more affordable at the end of the day, especially if you're making a lot of parts. Binder jetting really wins as its support material, especially in the green state, is often way easier to remove than something that comes out of an LPBF machine, maybe out of somebody like Velo for that big Velo energy. That often means that your end products tend to be considerably more affordable. And for a company like Apple, that is not just publicly traded, so they are legally bound to make the best decisions for their shareholders, but um, they've been in business long enough where they kind of know how to make money, okay? They're going to be doing a process that makes more sense in the long run. We've seen traditionally that they've used more subtractive manufacturing or even some sort of casting method that is incredibly laborious and is incredibly wasteful, especially if you do a bill it like a solid chunk of metal and then mill it down to be a smartwatch case. 3D printing will reduce that waste to nigh on zero or considerably lower than the metal. And because these are specialized machines do a very specific task and can leave the CNC machines, which can often serve more than just, you know, one type of purpose to do more work that can be more useful in other production lines. And we can see that back in July, a analyst from TF International Securities reported that Apple is actively adopting 3D printing technology. And at this time, they outlined the expectation that some of the titanium mechanical components of the new Apple Watch Ultra will be manufactured using metal 3D printing. And according to this, Analyst, Farsoon, and BLT are supplying the 3D printers, while Industrial Laser Systems Specialist is exclusively supplying the laser components. Now, binder jetting is the new one, right? LPBF makes sense to me because it's a well-known tech, you don't have a ton of shrinkage involved in it. While there is a little bit of extra work into it, there are some well-developed processes and procedures to make LPBF end-use parts that work well. Just as SpaceX, pretty much every rocket motor right now out there in the field that isn't made by the Russians is 3D printed. Whether it's out of Inconel, out of Niobium, or some other crazy crazy metal. The technology for metal 3D printing has really gone places. It makes total sense to me that Apple would look at adopting this. And in fact, I'm surprised that we don't see more of it. Traditionally, in terms of end-use products, we've seen that 3D printing is adopted most so far in the footwear industry, of all things, with Adidas being one of the first companies to adopt 3D printing in the mass production style with their Carbon 4D, where they actually partnered or are using Carbon 3D printers. No, that's not like a printer like the ones behind me running a carbon fiber filament, but actually printers from a company named carbon. They make a printer that is effectively a resin printer, but has an oxygen permeable membrane. I believe they call it the clip system where they're able to just pull the part out, just straight up, pull it out. And because they don't have that suction that we often deal with in the MSLA or SLA process, they're able to print significantly faster. In fact, it is one of the leading causes to failures in MSLA and SLA printers. Those are your laser resin printers. But of course, remember that resin is toxic when it is not cured. Carbon has figured it out, but carbon also is not you know, really a for the end user. It is very much for a business because they don't sell printers. They are a hardware as a service or Haas, not the mill, hardware as a service. But it works for companies like Adidas. Now, to be clear, that's not the first commercial use of 3D printing. In fact, Invisalign is actually the first one that I'm aware of where end use 3D printed products are being used. And you might say, well, Grant, how does Smile, Direct Club, and the others compete? They don't actually 3D print the retainers. They 3D print your teeth with everything moved, then they vacuum form over it. That's why often with Smile Direct Club, you'll see some kind of a gray powder with your retainers. And that is leftover SLS nylon powder 
from the process. It's a really cool thing. I would love to dive deep into these hardcore techs. Let me know if you guys want to see it. And in fact, we've got a local company with some concept laser metal powder bed fusion that do titanium. We've talked with them about doing an entire series all about metal 3D printing. So if you guys want to see that, let me know in those comments down below and I'll see if we can get that scheduled for maybe toward the end of the year or early next year because, uh, freaking metal metal printing is so cool i'm sorry it's it's bonkers that we can even do this and we can see that a recent bloomberg publication has backed up those findings pointing to production of apple watch cases using 3d printing metal technology and according to that report they're utilizing metal binder jetting as the 3d print of choice and then the parts are being milled in a post-processing stage now that one i don't know now, i would show you the bloomberg article but you literally can't read it without subscribing so uh cool but hey the cool thing is you can watch these videos without subscribing but we do recommend that you do because it costs you nothing and helps the channel grow this if true would be one of probably the most beneficial things in the 3D printing industry to come out that would make sense to the end consumer. Those of you that run 3D printing businesses know that the average person doesn't necessarily understand 3D printing. And if you have any family members that might kind of know what it is they might be asking you the same questions over and over and that can be a little bit tough but now you could say yeah actually you have one of those new apple watches right you have that new ultra yeah that whole outer casing is 3d printed whoa really yeah yeah it is and that shows the value instantly to the end consumer because now they have a way to conceptualize what 3d printing looks like and what it means but it also shows that 3d printing has a viable place in end use manufacturing even if it is oftentimes more expensive than traditional manufacturing sources. We traditionally look at 3D printing as a step in the process of product development and not as a end all be all product development thing. It's like in between making something with popsicle sticks and hot glue and injection molding, right? There's that in between, which is 3D printing that gives you a facsimile of the real product. But to be able to use 3D printing in an end use case scenario is fundamentally freaking awesome. And to me, that just shows that this industry has so much more room to grow. And quite frankly, a lot of us, myself included, have a lot to learn about where the line is between 3D printing being more of a hobby and short run stuff and it being an end use ready to run production. Because could Adidas have made made the 4D some other way. Probably they would have never gotten the pattern that they have. That pattern is pretty much only possible with 3D printing and they would have had much more expensive mold costs than it would be to basically lease a 3D printer from carbon. We can see that Easy MFG is based in Wuhan and they were founded in 2013 by a university professor and they launched their first metal binder jetting system in 2018. We can see that it is a third generation and the company has customers in Singapore Hong Kong, India, Russia, and Ukraine. And this thing is positively adorable. Most metal binder jetting printers are big, like big warehouse floor big, because often when you're looking at doing binder jetting in general, you're not looking at making small parts. One of the big benefits to metal binder jetting that you don't have with the sintering with the laser process is that it's cold and you don't have issues with layer warping. Yeah, uh, layer warping is a big deal beyond the FDM world. And if your nozzle crashes into your 3D print on your home 3D printer, eh, you might knock the part off the bed. If you're running a high speed printer like a bamboo, you could break the heat break on the printer itself. In metal 3D printers, it makes a very expensive noise, like $10,000 minimum kind of noise, if you're lucky and will often destroy the plate that you're printing on because, oh yeah, if you're gonna 3D print in metal, you have to start it on a plate of metal that then has to be cut off with generally a wire EDM. There is so much involved in metal 3D printing. And in fact, I would love to get some experts on. Um, SJ, I don't know if you watch the channel, but if you do, you gotta be a podcast guest pretty soon. I'm gonna reach out to you because we gotta make that happen. And yes, we can see that there is some issue with shrinkage. Uh, gentlemen, you know what I'm talking about. This one is the opposite. It shrinks when it gets hot not the other way around. And it is an 18 to 20% shrinkage rate because, well, you're getting rid of that excess binding fluid. And as the atoms and particles come closer together, they're gonna shrink. It's a natural occurrence, okay? 
all right? It's normal. But the idea behind binder jetting is pretty darn cool. You do have a risk of damage during the green state that's prior to it being centered, but if you can get a really good handling process, it is a much faster process, generally, than the layer powder bed fusion. It is not used as often in industry because the parts themselves are weaker than something that comes off of a layer powder bed fusion process, at least to my knowledge, and the metals are relatively limited in comparison, but 316L is a very common material. And as you can see, they're offering metal binder jetting printers at just over a hundred grand, which is an absolute ton of money. Unless you're looking for metal 3D printers, and at that point, uh, that is positively cheap. You look at something like the Mark Forge Metal X, that is over a hundred grand and that's a metal FDM printer, which is not going to get anywhere near the quality that a binder jetting process is. Now, I would generally assume that you're gonna have a smaller build volume at the $100,000 price point, but bringing metal 3D printing at or around the $100,000 price point makes it considerably more accessible to, you know, small to medium-sized businesses that want to involve this process into their systems that already exist, because the risk isn't that high at the end of the day, but they're still able to, well, make awesome and theoretically we are expecting to see the new apple watch 9 as early as september we do have some conflicting reports whether it's the actual watch ultra or the watch 9 but hey i'm looking forward to it either way and as a diehard android fanboy who does actually own two ipads because there is no Android tablet that comes even close. Apple, you're starting to pull me over, right? Being able to have something 3D printed on my wrist that is something other than something that looks interesting but has real function, and your phones have LiDAR in them. Man, it's like, it's hard to be an Android fanboy when all this cool tech is on the Apple side. But you know, don't, don't worry, don't worry. We're, we don't have two grand for a phone right now, okay? We gotta save up for some printers. <laughs> and as early as next Tuesday, we might find out to see what the future is for Apple and 3D printing. And I love that this has even been picked up by sites like Macworld and not just sites like 3D Printing Industry and 3D Natives. This is good. We want to see more hype around utilizing 3D printing for end use consumer products because one, it removes the stigma behind it, but two, it's just freaking cool. And if you agree with me, leave a like and let me know what would be some other awesome use cases for 3D printing that you can think of in end use production components. For me personally, I would love to see more high end audio utilizing 3D printing. But yeah, guys, let me know your thoughts in those comments below. I am really excited for this. And like I said, I'm probably not one going to be able to afford it because it looks like we're gonna be at least $700 for a freaking watch. If I'm spending $700 on a watch, it's a much nicer watch than an Apple watch. I am more interested in seeing more use cases for 3D printing in the consumer industry and not just in footwear or dental stuff. I would love to see it pop up more often in everyday products that the average person will grab, and potentially not even know that it's 3D printed. I mean, heck, I've been messing with some 3D printed earbuds for quite some time that you can buy off of Amazon for less than 20 bucks, which is really awesome. We'll be doing a video on that coming soon. That's all I got for you guys today. Stay safe out there. Don't forget to call your loved ones. And as always, keep making awesome. Have a good one. Hey, thanks so much for watching this video. A massive thank you goes out to all of our channel supporters whose names are listed right next to me at the $5 tier and higher. Remember, for as little as $1 a month, you can support the efforts that we do here on the channel. And uh, it goes directly into making sure that we can do more awesome content for you guys more often. We're going to be doing a lot more streaming coming up. We hope to see you all there. And thank you to all of our channel supporters that have made this kind of jump possible. Right below me will be our last look at cool 3D printing tech, which included 3D printing homes and 3D printing for preservation. Right next to that will be a random video that YouTube chooses for you. You should click them both. Not before you click on those comments, which is where I will see you and in the next one. Take care.